Um, not only did the two cities uh, differ with regard to labor and economic policies, but they also differed uh, substantially with regard to relations between uh, religions and races and ethnic groups uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, this issue has a particular impact for me because uh, one of the biggest differences between Minneapolis and St. Paul was regard, with regard to anti-Semitism. Uh, as a Jew growing up in Minneapolis, I knew that my parents had uh, dealt with that issue directly. Uh, my father was a physician. Uh, because he was a Jewish physician, he did not have admitting privileges for his, uh, his patients at uh, local hospitals. He had to go through a non-Jewish doctor every time he uh, wanted a, uh, a patient admitted. When I was very young, I think uh, in third grade, we moved out to South Minneapolis. I lived on Drew Avenue, and at that point, the blocks behind our house were open. We could look over to France Avenue, and I could look across the city line into Edina and know that I couldn't live there because at that point Jews were not allowed to live in, in Edina. In uh, 1946, a, uh, a journalist named Kerry McWilliams uh, wrote uh, a landmark article called Minneapolis the Curious Twin and the title of that article comes from his finding that there was substantially less anti-Semitism in St. Paul than there was in Minneapolis. In fact, he declares Minneapolis the capital of anti-Semitism in the United States. And uh, McWilliams says that Minneapolis was the only city that he knew of where, as a matter of practice, Jews were uh, prevented from joining the Civic, the civic Associations, the Lions, the Kiwanis, and even uh, the Automobile Association. And as a side, I remember growing up after that it changed and Jews were, in fact, admitted to the Automobile Association. My father vowed that he would never, ever go there to get directions for our family trips because of the past <laughs> history there. So why was there uh, so much less anti-Semitism in St. Paul than in Minneapolis? And I think that has to do, again, with the unique history of the two cities. Uh, to begin with, the Jews in St. Paul arrived there much earlier than the Jews arrived in Minneapolis. Uh, Jews mainly from Germany and what was then known as Bohemia came to St. Paul in the 1850s. They spoke German. They shared a common culture with non-Jewish uh, non Germans. Uh, they were integrated in the community. There was no residential segregation and they were very much a part of the economic and social mainstream in St. Paul. In 1855, they established the first Jewish congregation in Minnesota. Mount Zion and that synagogue uh, is still uh, operating today on Summit Avenue. Uh, they came when, of course, the social structure in Minneapolis and St. Paul was not in place yet. It was fluid and they could uh, really participate fully. Uh, Jews came later. Uh, the first uh, Reformed Jewish congregation wasn't established in Minneapolis until uh, the late 1870s. and. Um, the Jews in Minneapolis, the vast majority of them were not Germans. They came from Eastern Europe. They did not speak German. They spoke this strange amalgam of, of uh, German and Hebrew called Yiddish. Uh, they were sort of isolated in what some have called a golden ghetto in North Minneapolis. That's where my parents and grandparents uh, lived. And uh, they were separate. Their language was separate. And they were clearly outside of the mainstream. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a difficult reality that Jews of Minneapolis had to face, and that is one of their own. Uh, Kit Can was Jewish, and everybody knew he was Jewish, and that didn't help matters um, very much. In addition to that, uh, there were uh, some very uh, virulently anti-Semitic preachers. Uh, a man named Luke Rader and his son Paul Rader, who operated the River Lake uh, gospel Tabernacle on East Lake Street right before the Lake Street Bridge and they spewed out incredibly uh, virulent anti-Semitic, anti-black and anti-Catholic uh, sermons from their pulpit. The, um, and in 1939 Luke Rader runs for mayor of Minneapolis and in my part of town in the 12th Ward he gets about 18% of the vote which is a respectable showing even given his virulent anti-Semitism. 
Uh, the Raiders may have been sort of on the fringe, but in the 1930s, anti-Semitism uh, came uh, uncomfortably close to the mainstream. In 1938, the state had a very dramatic election. Elmer Benson, the incumbent farmer labor governor, was defeated by 32-year-old uh, Harold Stassen. Elmer Benson uh, was uh, attacked for having Jewish advisors who were communist, and some of them, in fact, were. And while Harold Stassen didn't directly use anti-Semitic appeals in that campaign, uh, some of his advisors did, and they circulated this cartoon uh, with three uh, men, obviously, uh, with Jewish features, Mr. Harris, uh, Mr. Rutchick, and I can't quite see who the third one is there, uh, Mr. Jacobs, uh, riding the um, uh, Elmer Benson donkey. So this issue of anti-Semitism certainly bubbled uh, underneath the surface. But uh, I think interestingly enough, the city was in for really a dramatic change during the World War II period. And uh, this is another theme of my book, and that is that Minneapolis has this capacity to reinvent itself. And while uh, that's often used as a term, a derogatory term, I think in the city's case, this reinvention really did have a substantial impact. And uh, during the World War II era, we would see a very significant change in attitudes, racial and ethnic attitudes in uh, in Minneapolis. And I think they were due in large part uh, to this fellow, uh, Hubert Humphrey. Uh, Humphrey is elected mayor of Minneapolis in 1945. When he takes office, he uh, writes that he's deeply distressed by the uh, prejudice that he sees, a rampant prejudice facing Jews, Negroes, and American Indians in Minneapolis. And he vows in his inaugural address uh, to do something about it. He says that the government can no longer ignore displays of bigotry, violence, and discrimination. And he mounts a successful effort, a human rights effort, to establish uh, a Fair Employment Practices Commission, one of the first municipal FEPC uh, agencies in the country. Uh, he's uh, an adroit politician, and he realizes he needs to build a base of support for this new civil rights effort so he draws on the religious community and he asks Reverend Luth, uh, Reuben Yendall, the minister of Mount Olivet Church, to head this, this uh, effort. Uh, Mount Olivet Lutheran Church uh, was and may still be the largest Lutheran church in the city and uh, in 1946 Reuben Yendall's brother Luther Yendall is elected governor of Minnesota. So Humphrey is shrewd enough to realize he needs to build a base of support and uh, that he does in a city which only uh, at the same time had been declared uh, the capital of anti-Semitism now has an, a Fair Employment Practices Commission and the climate of opinion uh, begins to substantially change. Obviously, uh, re prejudice and discrimination is not abolished, but I think it, with regard to anti-Semitism, it certainly does begin to fade away initially before the FEPC about 20% of the cases are brought by Jews, but that begins to disappear. And over the years, the FEPC focuses more on uh, racial discrimination. And clearly, the FEPC is not able to deal with those ingrained racial issues. But um, I think in the period that this occurred, uh, that there is a significant change in the climate of opinion. It does draw the base for civil rights effort. Uh, as we know, Hubert Humphrey then goes on in 1948 to give his famous civil rights speech at the Democratic National Convention and uh, really establishes a civil rights agenda for the whole country. Uh, what I'd like to do at this point, and I'm running out of time here, I've been babbling on and I've uh, told Dave uh, uh, 45 minutes and my time is uh, almost up here. Uh, I would like to finish up talking about, I, I can't really ignore where we are today, uh, this is the cover of my book, as you see the Stone Arch Bridge here, and I would like to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the uh, Riverfront Revival because, uh, as I was telling one of my former colleagues who played a key role in that, I think that the Riverfront Revival is probably uh, the best thing that's happened to Minneapolis in the 20th century. And I want to just give you a little flavor for how different things used to be in the old days, and I want to... Uh, 
and by quoting from a book by a man named Jonathan Rabin, who came to Minneapolis in 1979 and took a boat down the Mississippi and wrote about his experiences in a book called Old Glory and American Voyage. And uh, this is Rabin talking about the downtown riverfront right where we are today. He said, I had crossed and recrossed the Mississippi. Uh, there were 18 bridges over it in as many miles, and it seemed like I had been over most of them, yet I was having almost as much trouble as DeSoto in reaching the river bay. <laughs> Minneapolis went about its business as if the river didn't exist. No road that I could see led down to it. From a gloomy little bar on First Street, I could smell the Mississippi, but I couldn't see it. I didn't know how to reach it. Feeling foolish, I called the bartender over and said, how exactly do I get down to the Mississippi? Uh, the river, uh, she's on the far side of the tracks, the wrong side of the tracks, I said to myself. And while Raven couldn't have uh, realized it at the time, uh, 1979 was the time that this dramatic transformation was about to occur, and uh, if Raven came back about 25 years later, he would be amazed to know that uh, just within a stone's throw of here, there are condominiums selling for over $3 million a year in what used to be the wrong side of the tracks. So again, I think uh, the downtown revival is terrific. I'm so glad that I have a chance to give this talk right here where we can look out and see the results of that effort. And I think this is a good note for me to close on. So thank you very much, and I'd like to take some questions at this point.